You're listening to a message from Gateway Church Geelong. We hope it blesses you. For more information about Gateway, visit gc.org.au. Great segue there because this morning what we're talking about is our beliefs. And I know that when we when we look at a book like this, we can look at this and go, feels like I'm back at school. Feels like I'm just about to switch off and hopefully I'll pass the test later. Can I encourage you? We're talking about our beliefs. This stuff here is not just stuff in a book. It's not just paper and ink. It's actually talking about what we believe in our heart. Not what we know in our mind, it's what we believe in our heart. God has consumed our hearts and our beliefs actually revolve around the Word of God. So this morning, part two, our beliefs. Our beliefs. So 1 Timothy 4.16 says this, Watch your life and your doctrine closely. Persevere in them because if you do, you will save both yourselves and your hearers. Now a lot of people look at a scripture like that and they're like, Surely, surely that just means that the person who gets the microphone on Sunday needs to be really careful about what they say because God is, God is going to judge them for what they say to the people of the congregation. I would turn there and say, surely anybody who's raising a family, anybody who's actually looking after people within a family or workplace, I reckon it relates to us broadly. The Word of God, it's for us to actually live by every day, not just on, on Sunday. So this morning, as we look at our beliefs, can I encourage you, take note of what they are. Take note and persevere in them as we begin to walk forward in our next steps from this moment, because it's going to save you and the people that God has called you to actually look after within your world. Page 17, what we believe in our essential beliefs, we have unity. Who loves unity? Unity. I love unity. Amen. One of the things that really gets me is disunity. When there's discourse amongst it, it's like, it, like I struggle with that. Like, I, it, it stops me from sleeping because I'm like, I just hate the fact that there's disunity amongst people. I love unity. And in Ephesians 4.36, it says this, Make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. Make every effort. That sounds to me like you actually have to try and do something. So it's not sitting at home, it's like, fingers crossed. Oh no, I better get my Bible. No, oh no, I better pray. No, no, it's like make every effort. Do something to actually be a provider of unity amongst the body. There is one body and one spirit, just as you're called to one hope when you were called. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all who is over all and through all and in all. What, what, what does that mean to you this morning? One. One. Unity. Not two. Not three. One God. One Lord. One hope. One salvation. Unity. In every aspect of God, there is unity. He gives us the amazing example of what it is for us to actually live out the kingdom. Number two this morning, in non-essential beliefs, we have liberty. We, we tend to explain that in our church as grace. We have grace towards others. We have liberty towards others. Romans 4, and this is, if you look at, in your book this morning, Romans 4, 1, verse 4, 12 to 13 and 22. Accept, the, accept other believers who are weak in faith. Don't argue with them about they want, what they think is right or wrong. Isn't that hard sometimes? Just want to just like correct someone, whether it be gently or a bit harder. So you just got lo- to love people. Unity. Because eventually the Holy Spirit, who is great at His job, will begin to minister to their hearts. can do it so much gentler than we can. So much more to a heart place rather than you should do this. Who are you to condemn somebody else's servants? Their own master will judge whether they stand or fall. And with the Lord's help, they will stand and receive His approval. So I believe personally for us that, that we can encourage people. Because I, I honestly believe that when we come to people and say, you should do this, you should, you should do it this way, or no, you can't do that anymore because you're saved. And if you don't stop doing that, well, maybe you're not going to be. We need to encourage people. 
We need to encourage people with the Lord's help that will stand. Verse 12, yes, each of us will give a personal account to God. So let's stop condemning each other. Decide and, decide and said to live in such a way that you will not cause another believer to stumble or fall. Verse 22, you may believe there's nothing wrong with what you're doing, but keep it between yourself and God. Blessed are those who don't feel guilty for doing something they have decided is right. Can I encourage you today? There may be things that you've been brought up within your personal culture, within your family. Maybe, within a, maybe you grew up in another country and what was acceptable in that culture. Maybe within normal Australian culture, people are like, can I encourage you? Don't try and push your personal culture onto other people. Can I encourage you? Don't introduce people to your personal culture if they have an issue with it concerning the Bible. In fact, I would actually encourage you to go to God and say, God, the fact that other people have an issue with this personal culture of mine, do you have a personal issue with it too? Rather than trying to convince people that it's okay, because I truly believe that sometimes, maybe within our households that we grew up in, our personal culture was okay at the time, but God's calling us to always step up, always be refined, to be more Christ-like, that if you're trying to convince someone that it's okay, what you could actually be causing them to do is step into sin. A bit serious, isn't it? Be encouraged this morning. Always put it through the filter of God. Not through the filter of your peer who will say, yeah, it's, a, it's a kind of okay, I guess. Filter of God, not through filter of your peer. Unless your peer is Jesus, then you can put it through Jesus. Essential truths this morning. First and first and first this morning. The Bible is the Word of God. Don't let anybody tell you different. The Bible is the Word of God. Don't anyone try and water it down. So, oh, you know, I kind of believe some of it. Well, most of it's pretty good. 99.99. Look, the Bible was interpreted by humans. When I say interpret, I mean, so it was inspired originally and God had inspired people and they wrote it down. But then our version has been interpreted by, there's going to be some stuff in there that's not quite interpreted right. It's a given. We, we, it happens every day. Trent will say something to me and I'll interpret it. I'm like, then I say it back to him. He's like, no, I meant this. It's like, oh, sorry. I, I want to encourage you that the Bible is the Word of God. Believe the truths. Believe the truths. The, the Scripture this morning, we'll back it up scripturally. Don't believe what I say. Let's believe the Scripture this morning. 2 Timothy 3.16. All Scripture is inspired by God and is useful to teach us what is true and make us realise what is wrong in our lives. It straightens us out and teaches us to do what is right. 1 Thessalonians 2.13 Therefore, we never stop thanking God that when you received His message from us, you didn't think of our words as mere human ideas. You accepted what we said as the very Word of God, which of course it is. And this Word continues to work in you who believe. If you believe the Word of God, it will continue to work, work in you. If you do that to it and resist it, it will not continue to work in you. It will still be deposited in you. But it's like, eh, just don't want to hear that today. Don't want to hear that this year. Maybe one, maybe one day. Maybe one day I'll step into the promises. Just believe it and let it continue to work in you and refine you into being more Jesus-like. God's Word is the only completely reliable and truthful authority. And we, we accept, this is our church's stance and belief, we accept that the Bible is our manual for living. Our first question when faced with a decision is, what does the Bible say? We're talk, talking about dealing things within the church, within our families, as leaders within our families. That's a, what does the Bible say about that? Because I don't want to give people the, a mistruth or a kind of just left of center truth. We practice daily Bible reading and Bible study. The Bible is the basis for all we believe. All we believe. Number two, Jesus is the Son of God. If you're wondering this morning, it's like, is Jesus the Son of God? Jesus is the Son of God. Let's turn to the Word this morning. Jesus answered them, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Acts 4, 11 to 12, for Jesus is the one referred to in the Scriptures where it says, 
The stone that the builders rejected has now become the cornerstone. There is salvation in no one else. There is no other name in all of heaven for people to call on to save them. See, Jesus Christ, the second person of the Trinity, lived a sinless life on earth and voluntarily paid for our sin by dying on a cross as our substitute. What we deserved, He subbed in on our behalf. This accomplished salvation for all who receive grace by trusting in Him alone. He rose from the dead and is the only mediator between God and us. He baptises believers in the Holy Spirit and will return to earth to consummate history. Only through Him, only through Him that it can be finished, completed. Number three this morning, you must be born again. It's one of those words. Does everyone know what that means? Does everyone know what born again means? Maybe if you don't this morning, what what it means is we believe when Jesus actually, we accept, we confess with our mouth, believe in our hearts, Jesus comes and resides inside of us. And at that point, our heart, our spirit is regenerated, born new, because Jesus has actually come to do that and restored us in relationship with God. No more sin, no more guilt, no more shame. Grace comes and resides in our hearts, Jesus Christ, born again. This means that anyone who belongs to Christ has become a new person. The old is gone, a new life has begun. It's 2 Corinthians 5.17. Matthew 16.25 says this, Jesus, this is Jesus saying, If you try to keep your life for yourself, you'll lose it. But if you give up your life for me, you'll find true life. Isn't that true? Has anyone found that in their own personal walk with God? I know that I, know that I have. Just a new lease on life. Every season that I step through, I just feel like a greater lease on life. And it's not because I'm attaining more, it's because I'm attaining more of Jesus. He's he's giving me more. So good. God created, created humans to have fellowship with Him. And if you've been in the church for any length of time, we've talked about in Genesis that creation, Garden of Eden, God created us to have relationship with us and walk with us and talk with us. We're His creation to have fellowship with Him. But, but they defied God by sinfully going their own way. Talking about Adam and Eve. And as a result, we need God's saving grace to end our alienation from Him. Salvation comes only through God's grace, not human effort, and must be received personally by repentance and faith. Why do we say personally? It's not just enough to come to church with your parents and think that you're in a relationship with God. Now, it's awesome that our parents bring us to church because it takes us on this journey, these steps that we're taking, and it gets our hearts ready that when we have that encounter moment and God reveals Himself, all of a sudden it's like, I'm I'm ready now. I confess with my mouth, I believe in my heart. But it's not just enough to come along with somebody else. It's not just enough to have a grandmother that used to go to church and you never went. It's a personal acceptance of Jesus Christ, a personal repentance of our sins. At the end, everyone will experience bodily resurrection and judgment. Only believers will enjoy eternal fellowship with God. Isn't this? I mean, I'm loving life now, but I'm guessing at that point in time, I'm really going to be loving life. Number four. Believers can be spirit-filled and spirit-led. Acts 1.8 But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you and you will be my witnesses, telling people about me everywhere in Jerusalem, throughout Judea, in Samaria and to the ends of the earth. Acts 2.17-18 It says, In the last days God says, I will pour out my Spirit upon all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy Young men will see visions and your old men will dream dreams. In those days, I will pour out my Spirit even on my servants. Men and women alike, they will prophesy. That's us. That's us. Not just the people on the ministry team. That's us. All people. Don't discount yourself. You have salvation. You can have the Spirit of God in you and you can be doing those things that the Bible says that you can do. Luke 11, 13. If then... 
Though you are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children. How much more will your Father in heaven give the Holy Spirit to those who ask Him? How much more? How much more? What a great God. So we, we believe, I believe, we as a church believe, we, we believe that the only possible way to live the Christian life is by God's power within us. God's power within us. Every believer can be filled with the Holy Spirit by simply asking. We seek to practice a daily dependence on God's Spirit to enable us to do what is right. It's grace enables us to do what's right. It's not fighting against every day. It's like, oh, I don't want to do those things anymore. It's like, oh, just give me the Holy Spirit power inside of us enables us to stand up. God's power inside of us allows us to speak to our will. It's just like, I'm not doing that. I'm not doing that anymore. Number five, as believers, we follow the example of Jesus and are water baptised. Encourage, if you haven't been water baptised after this, you're probably going to want to. It's like, where do I sign up? I think there's actually some information out of the community hub on the desk if you're actually keen for that afterwards. Thank you, Bevan. As believers, we follow the example of Jesus. Matthew 28, 19. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptising them in the name of the Father, of the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Teach these new disciples to obey all the commands I've given you and be sure of this, I'm with you always, even to the end of the age. Acts 18, 8. I just love this guy's name. Love this guy's name. If we had another child... Crispus, Crispus Eden. It's got a nice ring to it, doesn't it? Crispus, the leader of the synagogue, and everyone in his household believed in the Lord. Many others in Corinth also heard Paul, became believers and were baptised. See, we, we truly believe that water baptism, it's a public testimony of what God has actually done in our lives was taken place in our lives. Baptism, it doesn't save us. Who can only save us? Awesome, we've got that down as part of our, our beliefs. But what it does do is this, it's an outward demonstration of what's actually happening in our hearts. And it's also an outward demonstration that's like our faith is in Jesus, our hope is in Jesus, and Jesus walked through the waters of baptism. So I wanna do that too. I wanna follow Jesus in every aspect of my life. Our beliefs. These beliefs are actually available on our website as well. If you lose your book alert, you can always go to the website, click what we believe on there. This morning, I'm going to go through this really, really quickly, but you can read over it in depth and detail. If you really want to go like into the nitty gritties and look up every single scripture that's attached to these, down the bottom, there's a link. And you can go to the ACC website and you can look up every single one. And you can get back to me in about six months. <laughs> we believe that the Bible is God's Word. It's accurate, authoritative and applicable to our everyday lives. We believe in one eternal God who is the creator of all things. He exists in three persons, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. He is totally loving and completely holy. We believe that sin has separated each of us from God and His purpose for our lives. We believe that the Lord Jesus Christ as both God and man is the only one who can reconcile us to God. He lived a sinless, exemplary life, died on a cross in our place, rose again to prove His victory and empower us for life. Aren't you glad of that this morning? We believe that in, in order to receive forgiveness, that the new birth, we must repent of our sins, believe, that the Lord Jesus, believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and submit to His will for our lives. We believe that in order to live holy and fruitful lives that God intends for us, we need to be baptised in water, be filled with the power of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit enables us to use spiritual gifts, including speaking in tongues, which is the initial evidence of baptism in the Holy Spirit. We, we believe that God has individually equipped us. Just, I'm just going to stop there. I'm going to go back to that. Let's be clear about this. Initial evidence of the Holy Spirit, baptised in speaking in tongues but you do not have to be saved by speaking in tongues. 
It can't, it can't happen that only Jesus, you cannot be saved. And so if someone comes to you and says, if you don't speak in tongues, you're not going to heaven. Ba-bong. Wrong, 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 wrong. Occultic, controlling behavior, telling you that you can't be something when the Bible states clearly it's through Jesus Christ. Did I get a little bit passionate about that? I think I did. I've just I've heard it way too much. Heard it way, just controlling people. No, Jesus. It's a gift from God that wants to give. It's not a controlling thing. It's like, I've got to do this, otherwise I'm not going to make it. God is loving. We heard the way Trent explained God's love this morning. That sums it up perfectly. I was just like melting in my seat. We believe that God has individually equipped us so that we can successfully achieve His purpose for our lives, which is to worship God, fulfill our role in the church and serve in the community in which we live. We believe that God wants to heal and transform us so that we can live healthy and prosperous lives in order to help others more effectively. We believe that our eternal destination of either heaven or hell is determined by a response to the Lord Jesus Christ. We believe that the Lord Jesus Christ is coming back again as He promised. How good is God? Awesome. Page 20. If you're worried this morning that it's page 20 of 44, it's actually not page 20 of 44. People are going to say, how the heck are we going to get through this? <laughs> 1 Timothy 3, 1 to 7. Here is a trustworthy saying, if anyone sets his heart on being an overseer, he desires a noble task. Now the overseer must be above reproach, the husband of one wife, just, would you want another one? <laughs> like, I love my wife. My wife is awesome. But I just, it, who would have the time? <laughs> it's like, why did you have to clarify that? Be the husband of one wife. Temperate, self-controlled, respectable, hospitable, able to teach, not given to drunkenness, not violent, but gentle, not quarrelsome, not a lover of money. He must manage his family well and see that his children obey him with proper respect. If anyone does not know how to manage his family, how can he take care of God's church? He, He must not be a recent convert or he may become conceited and fall under the same judgment as the devil. Let me clarify that. What that means is, The devil just wanted more power. So the devil wasn't always the devil. The devil was like the the head worship guy in heaven. But he just wanted more, wanted more power. Pride began to creep in. It's like, I I could do this. So God wants to encourage us. Like If we want to actually step up and be a leader within our families and a leader within the church and a leader in the marketplace, it's like become more mature as a Christian so that it doesn't trip us up down the track. That's what it means this morning. He must have a good reputation with outsiders so that he will not fall into disgrace into the devil's trap. We're talking about our structure this morning. I don't want to spend too long on this, but it's important that you know. It's important you know how we operate as a church. You have a right to know how we operate as a church. We're talking about the Gateway Church Long Governance. And we believe that Believers who invest their hearts, their time, their families and finances in building the local church deserve to have confidence in the church leadership. You, you, you deserve that. You deserve to have that confidence. Um, people who are looking for leaders to conduct themselves with uh, integrity and respect and making right decisions because it affects all of our lives when those decisions are made. Gateway Church Long is an incorporated association under the Associations Incorporations Act. Uh, according to this act, partnership is available. Um, can I encourage you, um, if you haven't been part of the church for six months, um, we'll actually ask you to wait if you, if you wanted to join us for a partnership thing. Um, partnership means you come along once a year to a AGM. And we sit down and we give you a full briefing in detail of everything that's been happening within finances and all that type of stuff. Um, Can I encourage you the way our church is set up? If you think that you want to become a partner because you're going to have some type of control within the church, that is not the way our church is set up. We're we're in unity together, working together. There's no sort of us and them, it's us. Us together. Amen? Just, Just put it out there. 
Clarification is awesome. Um, subject to the requirements of partnership bylaws, uh, for information can I encourage you, it says to speak to a Next Steps leader. Um, you can talk to myself, Naomi, Bevan, uh, Grant. Grant sort of looks after a whole lot of stuff within uh, the way our, our governance works, so he's a great point of contact for that as well. Um, number one, we're governed and guided by a board of elders. Uh, the board of elders are appointed by the senior pastor to oversee the finances and direct provision of physical facilities, so the church and the land and everything we have as, as needed. Uh, the board of elders are responsible for it to model a godly lifestyle, provide a prayer shield for family members and defend and protect the integrity of the church, to pray for the sick, mediate disputes, counsel, and represent the church to the community. Can I encourage you? I just wanted to clarify this because my mind probably would have gone to this place a couple of years ago. The board of elders are appointed by the senior pastor. Can I encourage you? I do not appoint yes people. I love people that actually say, are you sure that's the right thing to do? It's like, because it makes me stop and go, am I sure? Or was it just like, had some pizza? <laughs> that's why we have a board. We want to make good, healthy decisions because it affects all of us. Um, so we, we regularly will, something that would normally take five minutes within the board meeting could take 20 because it's backwards and forwards. It's like, is that the best possible way? Is that the best decision for us to actually move forward as a church? Uh, number two, we're guided by the pastoral team. The pastoral team is led by the senior pastor. This team oversees the day-to-day ministry and operations of the church. Uh, we're here to serve the congregation, uh, are responsible for the development of spiritual life of the church, are responsible for, uh, to model a godly lifestyle, provide a prayer shield for family members, defend and protect the integrity of the church. That doesn't mean we cover things up because that's not what we're about as a church at all. We're respon- yeah, responsible for uh, to pray for the sick, mediate disputes, counsel, and represent the church and the community. Our church is supported by department leaders. Um, this is something we've put a lot of focus on into the last, last year or so. Our department leaders are appointed by the senior pastor in consultation with the board to oversee various departments. And the reason we do that in consultation is if you go back to page 20 and look at what's outlined in what's required there to be an overseer in the church. We want to make sure that people are on the right track and the right journey because what's modelled from the department leader ultimately will end up being modelled within the people within the department as well. We learn from our leaders and we want to make sure that we're on the right track and the right journey together. Um, So providing uh, direction for care teams and people under their leadership uh, with the purpose to carry out the mission and vision and values of Gateway Church. That's that's what the heart of those leaders is there there for. And number four, strengthened by community connect leaders. Uh, That's probably new terminology for some of you. Uh, We used to call our small groups life groups. We've called it lots of things over the years, but uh, community connect groups, and it's our small group expression. It's what we do, do as a church. And these leaders are appointed by our pastors to care for the, the people of Gateway Church in small groups and gathering across the city of Greater Geelong. Get ready in 2017 for a massive launch with a whole lot more groups uh, within, within Geelong. We need more groups for the people who are spread out across Geelong. Get ready for that. If you want to be a, a community a connect group leader, Get ready because there's a course coming for you. Uh, get excited about it. If you like any, any desire to love people, be hospitable, have people come into your home, this is going to be an exciting season for you. Uh, number six, we're strengthened by relationship with the Australian Christian churches. Um, to clarify, I know that this has been a little bit confusing for people. The Australian Christian churches aren't different from what the Assemblies of God, it's just a name change. Just in case anyone was confused, that is just simply a name change. Um, Assemblies of God is a name that was inherited uh, from America. Assemblies of God is in America. And so it's, it's just a bit more relevant. We're the Australian Christian churches. It's who we are. Um, Gateway Church along is part of the Australian Christian Church. It's a national association of Pentecostal churches. Uh, the ACC is made up of numbers of pastors, churches and ministries who are committed in working together to attain common objectives. One of those things is seeing the gospel spread throughout our nation. Um, our finances. Has anyone ripped that page out yet? 
At Gateway Church, we practice tithing for the support of Christ's body, the church, as God commands. We recognize that giving 10% of our income is the biblical standard of giving. There are many people in this church that don't stop there. There are many people that go over and above and they give offerings and they give to missions and they give to the building fund. For those who don't know, we still have a loan on this property uh, and that's where the building fund money goes. We actually sow that against the loan so that it doesn't ha- the money doesn't have to come out of the general tithes to pay a building off. We want that money in the general tithes to be going out into the community to, so that the pastors and programs and we can be out there outreaching to people Friday mornings in the school and picking kids up in the bus, all those types of things. Um, many people love to give to God but, have, uh, but need to have confidence in the methods and purposes used by organisations in which they give. Can I encourage you? At no other time in history like at this moment, we are so fervent at being wise stewards of the money that comes into this house. It's not about us being able to like buy a whole lot of stuff uh, it's not about us trying to do more things or get nicer cars. Like, that is not where we're at. Money that comes in, we want to see the kingdom extended. We want to see people's hearts turn to God, see people confess with their mouth and believe in their heart that Jesus Christ is Lord. Therefore, there are a great number of people willing to give if they're able to see honesty, integrity, and genuine spiritual values respected in their lifestyles of their church leaders. The giving of tithes and offerings is worship to Jesus Christ as an expression of relationship between the individual giver and the Lord. That's why we don't uh, have people fill out pledge cards or make faith promises when we do sort of big things. We want to, we want to, and the stuff come up in 2007, and we want to see ourselves expand in our capacity for what God's called us to do. Um, funds are not income only, they're worship. And must not be considered as a business transaction. So you just rocked up and suddenly it's like, done my bit. No, it's not a bit. It's an act of worship to God. Act of worship to God is an expression of gratitude towards God. I think Bevan actually read out part of this scripture this morning, 2 Corinthians 9, 6 to 10. Remember this farmer who only plants a few seeds will get a small crop, but the one who plants generously will get a generous crop. You must each decide in your heart how much to give and don't, don't give reluctantly in response to pressure for God loves a person who gives cheerfully and, the, and God will generously provide all you need across every facet and area of your life this morning. Not just, not, not just talking about finances. Provide all that you need. Then you always have everything you need and plenty left over to share with others. As the scripture says, they share freely and give generously to the poor. Their good deeds will be remembered forever. For God is the one God who provides seed for the farmer and bread to eat. In the same way, He will provide and increase your resources and then provide, produce a great harvest of generosity in you. We're a church who believes in the biblical principle of tithing. We believe that it's through all of us contributing and collaborating together that it's possible to see, uh, continue to see the good news of Jesus shared with others and people within our community. See people reached, included and restored into relationship with God. Uh, this makes it possible for us, for all of us to be, for all to be in relationship with God and to be part of the church community and connect as his body and impact communities. We're all involved in that as we contribute together. We're all, we all have a hand in what actually happens in impacting the community around us. We, we believe that in the New Testament that, that followers of Jesus took this principle uh, further and at times radically gave to help those amongst them who were in need. Not all the time, but at times they radically gave. It wasn't every week, otherwise they would literally would have had nothing. But at times when, when the opportunity came up, they're like, I'm going to radically give to this because I see that there's a need. The one key thing with both of these biblical examples is that believers and followers together took responsibility to take care of their community and the people in it and the buildings that they met in. If you're new to Gateway Church, there is no pressure to give. In fact, there's no pressure to give at all. Our hope is that as you get a glimpse of the mission, get a glimpse of the vision that we have as a church and for the church and for those that we're actually called to love rather than feel the pressure or expectation or law, we, we, our heart and our prayer is that your heart is moved 
that your hearts move to contribute to seeing the kingdom of God come into the lives of others. Um, part four, our hope for you. In 2 Corinthians 10, 15, it says this, Nor do we boast and claim credit for the work someone else has done. Instead, we hope that your faith will grow so that the boundaries of our work among you will be extended. Our hope for you as individuals within this church is that your faith will grow, that your faith will grow so that the boundaries of our work among you will be extended. What does that mean? That as you go out into the workplace, as you go to university, as you go to school, as you connect with people in the community, that as your faith is growing, the boundaries of what happens in this place are blown wide open. So we, we preach great messages in here, but it's not for in here. I preached a message to the youth on Friday night. Hidden treasure that's not for hiding. Treasure in our heart, Jesus, but it's not for hiding. What happens in this place is not for in this place. What happens in this place is for outside of these walls. Amen. And it's our hope that, that you grow in that. And it's our hope that you'll become more spiritually and emotionally uh, mature in the things of God. Our hope for you this morning is this, just as we look at these couple of dot points, is that you embark on the next steps of your journey. Salvation is a first decision. That's like, I made a decision to accept Jesus. But what about the next steps of your journey in that relationship with Jesus? Making a decision to follow Jesus, to complete a gateway growth track, which is what we're doing as a church, to be baptised in water, Holy Spirit baptism, become a committed part of Gateway Church, to join a small group, to join a serving team, make a personal investment in the mission and vision of Gateway as a contributor, to always continue to walk in, uh, be enlarged in capacity as a disciple of Jesus. And it's our hope that you'll partner with Gateway, partner with the vision, partner with the mission. What it means to partner with this morning, this is, this is like some real revolutional stuff that you're about to hear this morning. So partner, normally it's like I, I foot out a bit of a form and I'm a, I'm a partner now. I paid, I paid a couple of bucks and I'm like a paid up member. No, no, no. The difference between attenders and partners can be summed up with one word. Commitment. Commitment. So if the level of your commitment is 1031 and then... 11.59, it's like just getting in and out real quick. You're an attender. And that's okay. There's next steps to the journey. It doesn't stop there. Just because you've been in that practice for all, it doesn't, it doesn't have to stay there. There's next steps to your journey. We would love you to not just be an attender, but someone who just is like, I just want to contribute. I want to commit to the God. I want to commit to what the vision and mission is actually causing us to be launched into as a church. And a tender is a consumer, a partner is a contributor. And just, just to clarify, there are moments where we switch in between those things, which is a healthy thing. If we're always contributing, we'd, always, we'd just be completely empty. There are moments, and that's why we hate having people rostered on four times a month. In, whether it's up here or on the host team, we want people to actually have a moment where there's like for two services a month where it's like, I'm just going to sit down. I'm going to actually have God minister to me. I'm going to listen to the word. I'm going to worship. So there, you switch in and out of those things, but you don't want to stay in either of those camps long term. Amen? Reasons for being a, a contributor. A biblical reason is Christ is committed to the church. Christ loved the church. He gave his life for it as it says in Ephesians. A cultural reason. It's an antidote for our society. We live in an age where there are very few want to be committed to anything. Committed to a job? Committed, isn't that true? We see that so much. Don't want to be committed to a marriage. Don't want to be committed to our country. This attitude has even produced a generation of church shoppers or church hoppers who... See, contributing, and we've talked about this, about pushing back against culture. Con contributing swims against the current of a consumer religion. It's an unselfish decision. Commitment, it builds character. 
When you commit to something long term, when it would have been really easy to give up, and it's like, you know what, it's too hard. I'm not valued. No one cares about me. Spending too much time in that headspace. So from down here, I'm going to commit to the things of God. From down here, I'm going to commit to what God's called me to. Such maturity, character built within us. A practical reason, it defines who can be counted on. You talk about rostering and trying to do stuff within the church and it's like trying to send buses out to pick up kids. It's, I, lo- I love the fact that Neville drives the bus a couple of times a month now. I love it. So awesome to see him like get on that 22-seater bus or 25-seater bus and going out and helping Rainu to pick up kids. Such a blessing to the church. He, he, is, he is actually showing us that he can be counted on. And I love it. It doesn't go unnoticed, Neville. Be encouraged by that. Drive that. It doesn't go unnoticed. Love it. It's a practical reason. Every team must have a roster and every school has to be, have an enrollment and every business has to have a payroll. Imagine if they didn't. Jeez. Every army has to have an enlistment and every country has to take a census, sort of. (laughs) Every country requires a voter registration. Making a personal investment to go all in and contribute identifies you as being part of the family that can be counted on. Number four, a personal reason. It produces spiritual growth. The New Testament places a major emphasis on our need to be Christians, to be in- accountable to each other, not just living as isolated silos as I talked about last week. It's, it's relevant for our spiritual growth. And you cannot be accountable when you're not committed to any specific church family. And whether that's here or whether God's spoken to be somewhere else, whatever that, we want you here. God's placed you here. Let's join it and commit as family. Amen. How can you contribute and partner? Number one, by protecting the unity of the church, which is the first part of our, our beliefs. Protecting the unity by acting in love towards other members. Are we always going to feel like we love other members? No. Do you always feel like you love your kids? My mum just said no. But we still act like that towards each other. And rather than just going, oh, I'm just going to put that down and push it down a bit and I'll just keep acting like it. There will come a time where you, could, you will learn how to have really healthy conversations with people. It's like, you know when you kind of said that, I took offence to it. Did you mean it like that? And so, like, oh, well, yeah, I kind of did. So can we talk about that? Just, just healthy conversation. By refusing to gossip. I hate gossip. I hate it. By following the leaders. Romans 14, 19 says this. So let us concentrate on the things that, which, which make for harmony and on the growth of our fellowship together. Romans 15, 5. Let us uh, live in complete harmony with each other, with the attitude of Christ towards each other, Christ-like behavior towards each, each other. 1 Peter 1.22, have a sincere love for your fellow believers. Love one another earnestly with all your hearts. It's a choice, it's a decision to actually do that as Jesus refines us. Ephesians 4.29, don't let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouths, but only what is helpful for building up others according to their needs, not your needs, to their needs. Selfless, loving. And lastly, Hebrews 13, 17, be responsive to your pastoral leaders. Listen to their counsel. They are alert to the condition of your lives and work under strict supervision of God. Contribute, the joy of their, contribute to the joy of their leadership, not its drudgery. Why would you want to make things harder for them? Amen, amen. I amen that this morning. <laughs> Is it wrong to amen your own scripture? Amen, amen. Can I encourage you? We, we are... We're here because we want to see you succeed and go, go into everything that God has for you. We have no other motivation because we're under God's strict supervision and what He's called us to do. No control, love, encouragement, at times maybe correction, but not control. We love you and want to see you succeed in your families, within your workplace and all that God's actually called you to do. 
How can you contribute to partner number two? By sharing the responsibility of your church, by praying for its growth, by inviting the unchurched to attend, by warmly welcoming those who visit. 1 Thessalonians 1, 2, to the church. We always thank God and pray for you constantly. It's a biblical practice to actually do that. Luke 14, 23, go out into the country and urge anyone you find to come in so that my house will be full. Romans 15, 7, so warmly welcome each other into the church, just as Christ has warmly welcomed you. Then God will be glorified. So that means even if you're not on the door hosting, it's okay to actually welcome someone warmly. Happy relationships, good times. Number three, by serving the ministry of, of my church. Why is it written my church? Because it's your church. I'm not, I'm not saying that it's my church. I'm saying it's when you read that, what do you read when you read that? By serving the ministry of my church. It's our church. So how do we do that? By discovering your gifts and talents. If you're like, I don't have any gifts or talents. It's time to discover them because you do. You're a 10 at something and we just got to find out what it is so that you can contribute and partner. By being equipped to serve by my pastors. That's what. That's why we preach the messages on Sunday. And that's why you probably found that a lot of the messages are becoming more and more practical so that when you leave, and head out into your week, you can actually take it with you and actually do something with it. By developing a servant's heart. Not a slave's heart, a servant's heart. Not my servant, because I'm here to serve you, because I'm a servant of, I'm a son, but my heart is to serve. By developing that servant's heart. 1 Peter 4.10, serve one another with the particular gifts God has given each of you. Ephesians 4, 11 and 12. God gave some to be pastors and teachers to prepare God's people for works of ministry so that the body of Christ may be built up. Philippians 2, 3 to 4 and then verse 7. Each of you should look not only to your own interests, but also to the interests of others. Your attitude should be the same as that of Jesus Christ, who took on the very nature of a servant, came not to, not to be served, but to serve. The ultimate expression of what a real leader is. If you've encountered anything other than that within your existence on planet Earth, where a leader is someone who's domineering and controlling, that person has not read the Scriptures properly and interpreted them properly. We're here to serve each other, the body of Christ, here to love and serve each other's interests. Number four, by supporting the testimony of my church. By attending church and small groups regularly and faithfully. Can I, can I just say this? When I don't see people here on a Sunday morning, I don't get angry, I get concerned. My, my heart goes, oh, they're missing. They're missing. We're, we're doing some things over the next couple of months to actually make sure that, that you can be cared for in a much more significant way, putting some practices in place to actually do that. But we do notice when you miss, when you're missing, but we don't get angry. We, we love you and we miss, we miss you. Just, just so that you're aware of that this morning. By supporting the testimony of my church, by living a godly life, by giving regularly. Acts 2.42, we love that scripture in this church. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to prayer. We've talked about how that in all of our meetings, you'll find some of that, whether it's a small group, a Sunday, whether it's a rehearsal, for on a Thursday night, there's gonna be some of that going on. Hebrews 10.25, let us not give up on the habit of meeting together but let us encourage one another. Philippians 1, 27. But whatever happens, make sure that your everyday life is worthy of the Gospel of Christ. 1 Corinthians 16, 2. Each one of you on the first day of each week should set aside a specific sum of money in proportion to what you have earned and use it for the offering. 
Leviticus, Leviticus 27.30. A tenth of all you produce is the Lord's and it's holy. Can I encourage you today? You know, we, we've, we've spoken, spoken this morning about our, our beliefs, what we believe, our essential beliefs. Uh, we've talked about truths. We've talked about uh, the things, that our, our beliefs about what the Bible is and who God is and who Jesus is and who the Holy Spirit is. And we talked about our structure and our go- governance and a whole range of things this morning, our finances. We talked about our hope for you, hope for you and your family, hope for you stepping up in the things of God, both within the church and outside the church. Can I, can I encourage you? This is the way I'm thinking at the moment. What happens here on Sunday and what happens out there on Monday it's just the same life. It's not a separate, it's not a separate thing. It's, we don't have a spiritual life and a working life. We just have a life that God has so graciously given, given us. And we, we want to see you as, as families, as individuals. We want you to take the next steps. You're going to hear, see that around a lot, of, a lot of the place within our church. The next steps of uh, what it means to contribute and partner and how can I be involved in my church and... Uh, I think as we do that, this is what I truly believe. And I said this to a smaller group of people. I haven't said it to the church before. This is what I truly believe. That as our church continues to grow, uh, as as people continue to join a church and get saved, just quietly, two young men on Friday night gave their heart to Jesus with the youth. First time decisions. So good. Yeah. Yeah. So good. And uh, be encouraged they were responding to the gospel. They weren't responding because there was some nice keyboard in the background, like there is right now. They were responding because they heard the gospel. They heard God's love for them. They heard about the treasure. And they're like, yeah, I want that. So good times. But I, I, this is what I believe, that if you're within this church right now, we're going to need leaders. We're going to need people who can lead small groups. We're going to need people who can run departments. We're going to be people who can love and run teams. And if you're in this church, it probably means that you're going to be doing something within the church. Pathways are opening up. There's ways opening up for you to be involved. And we've said it before, we're an open and inclusive church and we want to see you actually step into what God has for you. Um, what I'm trying to say is get excited because God's doing something. God's actually putting some key things in place so that we can actually launch into what He really wants us to do within the actual community around us. You know, this morning, there's nothing more that I would love to do at this moment than if we can just sing some worship to God.